I am so proud to be a BOA poet. And whenever I receive bo books from BOA, I always go to the back and see the list of names and the um, Poulin uh, Prize winners. And just, I, you know, obviously I look for my name. <laughs> but but to, see, to see all the other poets that, that I'm there with, um, it's just an unspeakable honor. And the people who were recognized and who were so shy, right? Peter, Melissa, Jenna, three people making this work. That's unbelievable. And the board members, you must be, you must know how important you are and how important this contribution you've made to the literary world is. I mean, you need to really go home and think, wow, I'm hot stuff, <laughs> okay? All right, so 40 years, that is amazing. Can we have another I mean, round of cheering for 40 years. Yeah, yeah. What's the point of being in a bar if you can't make a little noise? I'm proud of being a BOA poet, proud of the books that we've made together, none more so than Primitive, The Art and Life of Horace Pippin, um, which isn't a biography, really. It's more a reflection on Pippin's life and a response to his art. But I'm gonna tell you just a few things very quickly uh, about Pippin in case he's completely new to you or you didn't come to the, the earlier workshop. He was one of, the, he was the best known folk artist, African-American folk artist of the 1940s and the 1930s. He was a war hero. He fought in World War I with the legendary 369th Infantry that we call the Harlem Hellfighters. And they got the name Hellfighters from the Germans because they were such ferocious fighters. But they called themselves the Black Rattlers and they were also known as the Men of Bronze. These, this infantry was legendary. They, all the men who fought in it earned the Croix de Guerre, and Pippin was a war hero. He earned the Purple Heart, the Croix de Guerre, and he came home with a horrific injury. He, he was shot by um, a German sniper, and initially his, arm, his right arm was paralyzed. It was always very weak. Over the years, it got stronger. He couldn't um, lift it more than shoulder high. When he would paint, he would put the brush in his right hand, but he would use his left hand to support it. And he would always sort of have to think about what he was actually gonna put on the canvas before he actually did it. Um, the next thing that you need to know about Pippin, and this is, this is the vital thing, he left behind an incredible legacy. Not, not just his art, but he left the only visual record of the African-American soldiers of World War I painted by an African-American combat soldier. So he made a real contribution that um, scholars and historians still use to this day. For the first part of the program, I'm not gonna do a lot of narration. I think the poems are gonna speak for themselves. Um, and these will all be the war, coming, uh, his war poems. I'll, I'll be reflecting on the war, not his war poems. I'll be reflecting on the war and on his life as a soldier. So I'll just, you know, once I get started with those poems, I'm just gonna keep going. I won't be talking very much. Then we'll switch gears and we'll be, I'll present poems that are responding to his paintings and there I'll be talking a little bit more, all right? But I think to start out with, the voice I want you to hear is not mine, but Pippin's. If you go to the Smithsonian archives, you will find his war notebooks, which he tried to recount his experiences on the battlefields. So I'm gonna read two excerpts, and this will be Pippin's voice, and then I will go into the poems. Uh, the sound is all right for everybody? Okay, we're good? I tended guard, and all day before I fell asleep, I wished for a good night. But I wished in vain, for it rained all day, and it was raining now. The time came, and everyone was on post with blankets around them to keep warm. 
We did not have any overcoats with us, so we took blankets instead. There wasn't a man who could stand that again, no matter how good he was. I will say that much. If any man was in those frontline trenches for eight months or more, he couldn't do it again. We never took off even our shoes in those trenches until we got back to the front, until we got back again. We got back to where we could rest up, and it was always 20 days out of the month we put in the front lines, and more too at times. I know I seen my shoes on me for more than 30 days before I could pull them off. So that's one reason I say no man can do it again. He may have the will, but his body cannot do it. But at the time, we didn't care or give it a thought. We started for a five mile hike at three o'clock the next morning. We stayed back of the line for 10 days and we were to go in for 20 days. Again, as I said before, we did not care about it because we were hardened to it. But we had some new men with us to make up for what we lost. I had two in my squad and I knew what I had to deal with until they got used to the shells and I would have some time with them. But I found it was all right with my two. They kept their nerve. Well, one dark and rainy night, we were in the trench. It was one of the worst nights I'd seen in some time. Although it rains in that country all the time, it was not like it rained that night. And we were all down in the dugout, smoking and telling stories from one to the other. And I was on my bunk, taking it easy, looking at the smoke going up and thinking of the good old USA and wondering about Broadway. I thought I could see those bright lights shining. When a boy said to me, I wish I were home so I could see my mother, for I've not seen her in 15 years or more. I said there was not one soldier in France that wouldn't give anything just to have one hour for home, for I would give it myself if I had a chance to do it. Then he told me about a dream he had I was with my mother, he said, and had a fine time. It seemed as if I was going out someplace and she asked me to come back to her. And when I started to go back, well, here I am. Go to bed, someone shouted. I did not say any more, for I saw that he took it hard. The Speller. Writing with your rigid shoulder, with the weaker hand, two years after the Great War. You try to shape words that you could not spell, sounding them out. Raining, R-A-I-N-E-I-N-G. Plain, P-L-A-Y-E-N. Bob wire, barb wire, B-O-B-W-I-R. Influenza, I-N-F-I-N-Z-E. Rolling them on your tongue like Demosthenes stones, leaden shot spat out at shine targets. In a notebook, you bend the language, hell place, no man's land, and mark in ink uncertain places, Leon, Oregon, Cantonazaire, Marpre Court, but words are poor gazetteers, campus compasses for the lost. We stumble over consonants and vowels. We are strangers in our own language. What to call the ripped earth where boys wait in ditches beneath bursting shells? You called it terrible ground of sorrow. Terrible, T-E-R-I-B-E-L-L spelled so that we will hear the voices ringing with terror, the howl of the O and the deeper O of sorrow. A Cannel, and it starts with an epigraph by Horace H. Pippin in which he's writing about a candle I had a candle, so I lit it, and it went out. 
I tried it again, and it did the same. So I cut off the stem, thinking I could get it to burn. I could not. I seen others do the same thing, so I knew that this dugout were too damp for a candle. Tallow, wick, flame, smoke. A candle cast off illumin illumination like shed skin or estrus scent. A candle, a candle, an incandescence, this need for light to see, to read a shirt for lice, to read and reread a letter already seared into memory, to seek in a candle's flame proof that they are what they used to be, brother, son, father. Doughboy, you try to light a candle, to marshal light in a dugout's damp, but light is loss. We see and yet there flares the unseen, the shadows veil, the corner recast in cast iron black. Such poor technologies, cannels, flamethrowers, very flares, the match the soldier strikes for his last cigarette, or the char, once human, caught on a barbed wire rack. Within a dugout's dark, a soldier tries to light a candle and fails, but then earns its light and blots out all beyond the boundary of its shining. He sees only the splintered shelf where he will sleep. He sees a gun's wooden stock. He sees the animate mud that soils his cuff and seam. But the men around him are only sonorous breath a creaking bunk, a cough, a blanket shifted. Within a candle's light, the dimness merciful, perhaps. He sees so little and only a little way ahead. Night March, 369th Infantry, it has an epigraph by Horace H. Pippin. Even at night, he says, we could not travel without being seen by the skyline. Out of the gunmetal dark, in the armored black, come the muffled monologues of canteen and kit, and the knock of a rifle stock against a weary thigh. Harlem's sons marching in long onyx columns over hill and ridge, hunched shadows shadowing other hunched shadows under a bruised sky. They hear the dirge of bursting shells and feel beneath hobnob boots like the beat of an invalid's fist against a board, the dull drum of battle, but weary they go on, weary they march the men of bronze, searching the darkness, spying in the galaxies above a vaster army, bright with bayonets. And in that starry encampment, the moon shines like a letter from home, unfolded and full. Come home safe. They're telling us it won't be long now. Be careful. We miss you. Duty bound, they tuck away their memory of light and march with heavy steps, with gear bent shoulders, the soldiers of democracy heading towards a dugout damp and the stolen sleep that soldiers know, quick and deep and near to death. Like this, like that. Like this, like that, the men fell, folded, flopped atop the earth like fish. Flounders floundered in a sea of mud beneath gaseous nets, black sky, choking sky. They choke and cough their grieving, suck, forget from a cigarette, and in a dugout's wet, they read their letters and speak of girls shapely as parlor lamps. They pick their lice and cuss, cuss, cuss the bush, and in a quiet hush, 
They speak of home, till like this, like that, evening falls beneath the wire. The sun, a mortar shell, explodes, blood gold, blood cold, gilds the wire, gilds the rat, and shrouds their faces in sanguine glory before the night, before the bayonet of night. Y'all still with me? <laughs> Breathing helps, then I know I'm not reading to dead people. <laughs> Fire. In his knapsack, he tucked a notebook of sketches, limed in hurried slashes and pencil strokes. The 369th Infantry, France, during the spring and summer of the war, lovely names, Saint Nazaire, Bois de Hazy, Mafracourt, and unlovely Champagne Marne, Ein Marne, Meuse Argonne, battles and blasts delicately drawn, delicately shaded by the colored sketches of a Negro doughboy, leaves of witness that for security's sake he burned. Nothing whispered, don't, they will want to know. Your memory will be trophy and ossuary and record. Nothing stayed his hand or shouted, stop. A Negro soldier burns the pages of his notebook beside the door of a dugout, undisturbed. The pages, like paper fists, open and curl to grasp each flame's finger. The blackened leaves rise as smoke rises, and in the trenches, black men pass around the last smoke before the wire. The stub pass from mouth to mouth, sweet with spit, sweet because it is the last, drawing the smoke deep into their lungs, letting it rise, knowing they must follow. Horace Pippin's Red, and it has an epigraph by John Berger. Look, it's not so heavy now, but it's passionless. Perhaps no red can have that passion unless a body has been painted near it or inside it. Could it be that red is the color that is continually asking for a body? Not so heavy now. The dead man lay on top of him, heavy as mud, unmovable, leaking blood. Blood of two men mixing like wines. Blood mixing with mud, mixing with rain. The icy gray rain that tasted like blood, like sweat, like the words men cry out unheard before they die. He could not move the weight, push death aside, not with a blasted arm, not while blood seeped from his splintered shoulder. Thirsty, cold, waiting, the sniper where? His unit where? The corpse held him and would not let go. Death's intimacy, or the last gift the dying give, to hold us, to linger. Death heavy as an hour abandoned in a maw of mud. What to say to a dead Frenchman, the soldier who tried to save you? From his bullet hole, small black vowels leak, mon dieu, mon dieu. But what to answer? Why does he hold you? A man dead, because death would not allow a man to reach for another, to save him, to lift him, Death's cynicism, there can be no heroes. Unless a body has been painted with sunlight, skin, the beloved's lick and salt lick sweetness, with rain spilling, with shadow, soap, salve, with tattoos of scent, unless a body has been painted, touched, smooth with grease, slashed with elm switches, pushed, shoved, straddled, unless a body has been painted, swaddled, scarred, worn mud, blessed with blood, 
Is it a body? Is it a human body? Red is the color that asks for a body. How does the eye read color? Are you sure about the hue of your skin? Does the light deceive in constant light that never stays? Deceived, we think we are dust, but we are articula articulations of light. We are flames, our tongues are brands. They burn and incinerate words. To paint wounds, dip a boar bristled brush or tip a finger into cadmium selenide or cadmium sulfide. When the Hebrews painted red on their lentils, death passed over. Red is the color that asks for a body. Even this body you failed to save. No work, this is hard, no work as hard hoisting slack bodies, wrestling the dead through waste of mud over ruptured earth. We were trying, Pippin said, to get back with our dead ones. It, were the, it was the hardest job I ever had to drag a dead man over that rough no man's land. Heaved, dragged, lugged, the sacred work of war, not to bury, not to weigh with stone or ceremony, but a more arduous labor, hardest to lift, to carry, always. So those are the war poems uh, responding to the war. And Pippin carried the war with him always. He returned home, In 1920 he married, he married Jenna, Jenna Ora Featherstone Wade Giles. She had had two husbands before him. She had a young son, Richard, who would become Pippin's stepson. And they would settle in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And Jenny says that Pippin suffered from blue spells. Today we'd recognize that he probably was suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. And if you study his life, you see that alcoholism um, became a part of it and the war never left him. So you have to imagine it's winter, it's late night. Jenny is upstairs, there's a brick townhouse, three stories. She's upstairs sleeping, Richard is sleeping. Pippin, who struggled to sleep, is in the kitchen. There's a fire burning in the, the stove, and there's a poker in the stove to stir and stoke up the embers. And there's um, some planks there in the kitchen, a table leaf. And Pippin looks at the poker, that hot poker, and he looks at that plank of wood, and he gets an idea. He takes the plank. And you can only imagine how difficult it must have been with his arm, but he somehow gets that plank up against his knees, he takes that hot poker, and I don't know how the man managed it, but he burned a picture into the table leaf. And if you see it, it's a picture of a man, he's walking past a forest, and the trees, there's no leaves on them, they look exactly like the trees he would paint of no man's land that have been blasted by shell fire, these bare, witchy looking, branches and this man all by himself is going through this deep snow and what comes off this board is nothing but sheer loneliness and that was his first work of art and he thought that he'd invented this procedure of drawing with with the hot poker but it's 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 called a pyrograph he made a, a, a picture out of fire essentially so that he made a series of pyrographs after that and then he started his first painting which is called the end of the war it took him three years to finish it so the next poems I want to read are responding to Pippin's art and I think let take if you've got the book look on the cover and you'll know um, the poem that I'm talking about which is going to be uh, a primitive portrait and one of the things I forgot to do was to set the timer. It was probably a Freudian slip. When am I, when am I supposed to shut up? <laughs> no, no, no. What time am I supposed to stop? Don't be shy. Tell me when. 
Lord have mercy. Okay, okay, okay. You know what's funny is I always time it in my bedroom and then when you get in front of the audience, it is never, never that time. All right, a primitive portrait. So it's the one on the cover. Despite distortion or because of distortion, the eye lingers, stayed by his white shirt, by the subject's demeanor, by the clean attention and spare composition suggested by blue space, blue air, or maybe a blue wall, austere composition and attention in self-portrait 1941 where a man sits astride a slat back chair before canvas and easel. On his unseen shoulder lies an unseen scar, the shrapnel of an unseen war. In his lap, a cupped hand balances a brush in a cage of fingers. His thighs propped wide are heavy and sexual. Art is dangerous, Ellington said. When it ceases to be dangerous, you don't want it. This is a portrait of an American Negro, a Negro artist between the Scottsboro Boys and the Detroit riots, two years after the great concerto and the very year that Kenny Clark, Charlie Parker, and Thelonious Monk would jam at Minton's. He looked like the new Negro, but with sleeves rolled and ready. He triangulates body, chair, and easel, a confident equation, I am, he says, I am, as if any Negro alters the canvas. Skin as canvas stretched taut over its frame. What do we paint on it now? What did he? Time shift. An MP3 player. Billie Holiday speaks in a post-postmodern collage, a music shaped from the reconstructed patterns of her voice. I was scared to death. I was always scared. This is a portrait of a woman's voice, a woman speaking, and the primitive music in any speech, the primitive patterns that make speech, the music of speech, which seems primitive. On another disc, Billie Holiday sings Strange Fruit in 1939, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. A Negro primitive paints a self-portrait, but how? What new freedom allows him to see, allows the art, allows the man seeing himself as art, as he wants to see himself or wants you to see him? Look again at the portrait. Heroic, broad shoulders, handsome, his piercing stare settling the question. He is a man, has a man's body, a man's will, a man's sex, a man's gaze. It will not require 1,369 light bulbs to see him. On the, at, the, at the hand that seems too small, at the brush as long as his arm and tipped in white. Notice his legs spread like a jazz drummer's, though he never improvised. He thought everything out foreground, background, his mind walked across the canvas, his heart plied the paint like a gandy dancer. I paint it, I take my time, he said, and examine every coat of paint carefully, and to be sure that the exact color which I have in mind is satisfactory to me. There it is, satisfaction, to be satisfied and black to choose where and when, to determine the details, precisions that were not, as they said, primitive, but human. On his canvas, he is in process, his brush tipped with might be rather than is so, his lips latched by solemnity, words never the medium for what he would seal with color. The canvas tilts away from, refuses our gaze, the crude measure of our eyes. This is a portrait of a dark body, a dark manhood, a dark center. The eye cannot avoid him, cannot make him background or frame. He holds the brush, already sees what he will paint, looks toward what will be, what we do not yet know. I have two minutes left, but Boa likes me. 
So rather than reading all of the other poems I had, I will read one that will fit the time, minute, time limit and then one more. They can't really complain about that. So I'm going to read a difficult poem, which I think is a, a very is, is a necessary poem to read about Pippin. Um, it is called The Prophet. I think it's an important poem because the other thing to know about Horace Pippin is that he was a man of faith. He was profoundly and deeply religious. He says in his notebooks when he was on the battlefield that there wasn't a man who didn't pray to his maker to help him through. And he says, the, that's how I made it through. I prayed to the Lord. So this poem is called Prophet. If you've got the book, follow along because it is a difficult poem to follow. If you don't have the book, shame on you for not buying it sooner. Okay, no, no, no. Uh, look out over the shoulder or steal one from somebody who has it. Um, it starts with an epigraph by Elizabeth Sparhawk Jones, and she says, I knew him. I knew him. He was a big cornfield darky, filled with the religion that Negroes get. And he used to quote Isaiah there in his studio or any of the other great prophets, little or big. He was filled with it. He was not, he was filled, not as they thought, with certainty, but with faith. Which in the way that a blade of blue stem is not a blade of switchgrass, is always particular, he was filled with his faith. Filled to contain fully, to have no capacity for more. Desire sated, although when is desire sated? And so his teaching, and so his reaching, he was filled, no not filled. The mind is never filled and never empty, faith cannot satisfy. Unfilled, he reread he re Isaiah 11, verse 9, painted the prophet's revelations, the cow eating placidly beside the wolf, the black child sitting on the same lawn as the white, white crosses and red poppies above the graves of soldiers. He asked, studied, prayed, practiced the obsessions of the self-taught, a gift for pattern, of faith in repetition. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Full, that is what he said to them. Artist, soldier, cornfield darkey. This was his prophecy that sated we would have no faith in victory or defeat, and there would be no war. Sated, our avarice could end. And so his canvas, and so he turned old wounds into paint, and so the color red to kindle satisfaction, to make the eye for one brief moment believe and require in an instant nothing more. And then the last poem, so that Boa will one day publish me again. <laughs> um, I'm, going to, I'm going to close with this one. Uh, again, it seems appropriate. And it is blessing. And those of you who are following, it's on page 91. Ending a poetry book is, you know, finding what that last poem should be is, is difficult sometimes. Um, and it was difficult for this book. But I thought uh, going back to Pippin and his faith and what he might do is how I get here. This poem also has an epigraph. And it's by Carl Phillips, a poet I deeply admire. Carl Phillips writes, when it comes to the gods always crippling those whom they love most, 
as a way of ensuring the beloved both fear and need, where, in fact, does it ever say so? He would not have disagreed with you, men washed in flames, boys chewing the clots of melted lungs, slack hands cupping bloodied rain, each soldier's body shaped into a burning bush, into hallowed ground. Mindful of his own ruined shoulder, he would not have disagreed about the ones the gods held most beloved. For he had wrestled, as the Bible says, struggled, had felt his shoulder unhinged by an enemy whose face he never saw. Let me go, for it is daybreak. He had waited the long hours, cold hours, beneath the rain-sopped weight of a dead soldier before an awful canvas. Let me go, for it is daybreak. He had wrestled with the dead in the bottom of a shell hole and held on. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Demanding a blessing and given one, inward vision, to look and look again, wrestling through sleepless nights, sorrow's vast wings. A soldier who said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Riven by a sniper's bullet, he held on, refused to let go or to die. Let me go, but he held his weakened arm in his stronger hand, gripped the brush, pushed paint against an empty canvas, painted what held him, what he held, refusing an ending. I must end here. Okay. Okay.